Thanks for being here today. If you would, go ahead and take your Bible out and we're going to continue in our study of the book of John. We're in chapter 6. We're going to pick up in verse 25. We're going to read a lot of scripture today. There's going to be so much theology contained in what we've got today. I can't cover everything that is in there, but I really don't think it's good to break this section of scripture up because it's all talking about Jesus being the bread of life. So that's the main point. Today we're going to look at Jesus' words that he spoke the day after he turned the fire five loaves into two fishes uh, into the enough to feed the multitude 5,000 men, probably about 20,000 people that he had fed. Uh, the miracle happened to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God so that everybody would know that Jesus was the Son of God. Now the reason that Jesus is going to speak on the bread of life and call himself the bread of life is because the bread is what the people have on their minds. For example, some some of you will go out to eat. Some of you might have even gone out to eat last night to your favorite restaurant. And when you go to your favorite restaurant, the first thing they do is they come and they take your order. And when they take their order, you, they take your uh, drink order. So you'll tell them you want your sweet tea or you want some Coke or Diet Coke, whatever it is that you get. And the next thing that you're waiting for them to bring out is what? The rolls. Because you know the bread is coming. And when the bread comes, you're going to take that bread out of that basket. And usually they've got some butter. They might have a knife there for you to cut the butter with and to spread it all over. Or they might have it in one of those baskets where the butter is just running down all the way. And you take that bread and you break it loose and you dip it down. And you do something like this. Mm. Because you couldn't wait to digest you couldn't wait to get your hands on that bread because you thought after you had to wait in that line for two hours out front when they said it'd be 15 minutes, you thought that you were literally going to starve to death before you got in there. But when that bread came, you were so happy to have that bread. Kind of have that thought in your head when we're looking at this message today that Jesus Christ is not literally a piece of bread, but He is the thing, He is the one who sustains us, not only spiritually, but He sustains us physically in our lives. Now there's these two events that have happened. One is that Jesus has fed the, the, the 5,000 men and their families, about 20,000 people. But also remember the message that was right before that. He spoke to the Pharisees and He told them there were going to be four resurrections. Do you remember that? The first resurrection was when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. There's a spiritual resurrection that takes place inside of us. Jesus made mention of that. The next He said there's also a resurrection going to be whenever He dies on the cross. They're going to place Him in the tomb and on the third day He's going to rise from the grave. So he talked about the, those two resurrections. And then he says there's going to be two more resurrections after that. There's going to be the resurrection where the, where the dead in Christ rise, which is when you and I die and we're placed in the ground. There's coming a day when Jesus Christ, when He turns, our bodies will be brought up from the ground or our ashes from wherever they are all over the world will be brought back together and put into a supernatural form and created a new body. We talked about that. And then we also talked about that after that resurrection, after, after a period of time, there'll be a fourth resurrection when all of the dead will be raised. And it'll be the dead being raised so that they can be judged. And what the Pharisees were so mad about was Jesus alluded to the fact that they were probably going to be in the fourth resurrection because they didn't accept who He was. Now remember all of this is happening within just a couple of days of each other. Jesus leaves the, the area where the Pharisees were and the Sadducees and the people he was talking to. He crosses the Sea of Galilee. He goes over there. He feeds the multitudes. And he turns right around and he comes back in here again. So these people are still mad. Just, by, just out of curiosity, has anybody ever been in here? Has anybody in here ever been so mad you were mad for more than a day? <laughs> anybody ever been here so mad you were mad for a week? <laughs> anybody ever been in here so you were mad you stayed mad the whole year? I mean, you know, let's face it, somebody can make you that mad. And Jesus had made these guys that mad. So when they're, the, when they're coming back, they've still got that. They're so mad at Jesus when He stands up and starts speaking, they're not listening to what Jesus is saying because they're still thinking about what it is that they're mad about. And if you've ever been in that situation, would you just say amen? Amen. I know I have. I know I have. 
Jesus, Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life, is one of seven sayings that Jesus makes in the book of John. We're going to look at all seven of these as time rolls by as we come to them in the text. The first one today is the bread of life, which is what we're going to talk about. But he also says he is the light of the world. He says he is the gate. He says he is the good shepherd. He says, I am the resurrection. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the vine. So all of these are going to come up. But all of these are word pictures so that people like you and I can know what Jesus is is explaining. But generally speaking, when it comes to spiritual issues, we're kind of ignorant in this area, and the Holy Spirit has to wake us up and show us what's contained in there. Now, Jesus, uh, before we read, I want to put a couple of things in context, and I want you to remember about that context that Jesus made the Pharisees mad, then after Jesus made the Pharisees mad, He goes and He turns the he, he turns the, the two loaves, I mean the five loaves and the two fish into bread, then He goes and He tells the disciples to get in the boat and go over to the other Sea of Galilee. He goes up on top of the mountain. He prays, spends some time with the Father. When he comes back, you remember the disciples have been rowing the boat trying to get across there, but the waves came up. They couldn't get across. They turn up and look, and who do they see walking on the water? Jesus Christ. Jesus comes over to them and he says, Be not afraid, for it is I. And Jesus steps back in the boat with them. And as soon as they step in the boat, they're teleported immediately to the other side of the lake where they get back out on the other side. So this is when this conversation is taking place. I want you, you're going to need to remember those things. But now as we read the Scripture, and like I said, we're going to read a lot of Scripture, I want you to look for four things. There's four things. In fact, I'm going to throw them up on the screen so you can see what those four things are that I want you to look at. The first is how many times Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And then after He says, I am the bread of life, I want you to see where it says, I came from heaven. He's going to say, I came from heaven. And then He's going to say, the Spirit gives life. We're going to, we're going to stop at each one of these and we're we're going to look at what they say. And the last one he's going to say, and this is the one that's probably be most controversial in the neighborhood in which we live because many people treat, preach doctrine that is different from this, but it's what Jesus said. And by the way, if Jesus says something, is it the truth? Okay, all right. He's going to say, I lose nothing that is given to me. By the way, how many of y'all have ever lost something that was given to you? I've, I lose everything. If I, if my daddy used to tell me, Stevie, if your head wasn't screwed on, you'd lose it. I mean, if it wasn't attached, all right? All right, let's read the text and, and just look for those sayings. Look for that verbiage that we see in here. And we're going to pick up in, uh, which, which verse did I say we we're going to pick up on? We're going to pick up on verse 25. Yeah, 625, 625. Picking up in verse 25 where it says, And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Okay, you, the only reason you're following me is you got some free bread yesterday. It was real good, and you want to come back and get you some more free bread. Let's just be honest. He's telling them that's why they came. Do not work for food that perishes. He says, don't focus on the bread that you ate but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on Him God the Father has set His seal. Then they said to Him, What must we do to, to, to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, and this is a strange sentence, This is the work of God that you believe in Him, in Him whom He has sent. Now I want you to notice what He said. This is the work of God that you believe. So belief is not your work. Belief is the work of God, according to the text, right? So whose works is it that is saving us when we believe? It's God's works. Okay, don't mess that. So they said to Him, then what sign do you do that we may see in belief? In other words, you've been going around doing miracles everywhere else. Why don't you do a miracle for us? The Pharisees and Sadducees are saying to him. What works do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. In other words, they're, they're, what they're alluding to is Moses, Moses produced manna to prove who he was. We want you to produce bread right now so we can know that you are who you say you are. Picking back up to verse 32. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. And for, 
For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven. He's going to say this seven times, by the way. And gives life to the Word. They said to Him, Sir, give us this bread always. Just like they got in the wilderness, the 40 years they were in the wilderness, remember how they got manna every day so they didn't have to work for it, it just came out and they went out there and just picked it up. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father has given me will come to me. Come and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that He has given me, but rise it up on the last day. So he's talking about the people that are going to come for the bread. He's not going to lose any of them. Verse 40. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life and I will rise Him up on the last day. Remember the the message a couple weeks ago about the resurrections? He's still going back to those resurrections. He's talking about that again. So the Jews grumbled about Him because He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. He says, came down from heaven again. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? But how does he now say, I came down from heaven? Well, of course, we know that because of the conception that took place in Mary's body when the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and she became pregnant. But they don't know that. 43, Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. You get what he just said right there? The only ones that are coming to me are the ones that I'm going to call to me. And when I call them to me, they're going to be saved and they're going to rise up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. In other words, Jesus has seen the Father because he came from heaven down to here and he's going back up to heaven because he's going to see the Father again when he gets up there. But in the meantime, the only way to see the Father is to see the Son because the Son is an exact representation of the Father, which is what other scripture teaches. Verse 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Talking about himself. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, I will live forever, and the bread that I will give uh, for the life for the life of the world is in my flesh. In other words, he's in the flesh here, down here now, so they can see him, touch him, feel him, know that he's there. Verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Surely we're not going to be eating your body. Surely we're not cannibals. Pick it back up in verse 53. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of the Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is the true food, and my blood is the true drink. And whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, whoever feeds on me, whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread that the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread, meaning Jesus himself, partaking him like we love bread, into our lives, we'll live forever. Verse 59, Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. And when 
This, this messed everybody's mind up. This, this teaching right here, boom, it blew their minds. And when many of the disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, he said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? And by the way, do they see, do the disciples see Jesus ascend to where he was before? Acts chapter 1. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is, is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. In other words, he knew there would be some false people come in along the way. Verse 65. And he said, this is why I told you, no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And after this, Many of his disciples turned back and they no longer walked with him. They didn't like what he said. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered, Did I not choose you? Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet, one of you is a devil. And he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. And all of God's people said, Wow, was there a lot of stuff in that passage right there? Sure was. The only way I know how to do this is to break it down into little short pieces and look at it so we can understand the major portions which will help us understand the rest of it. The first is we've got to understand that Jesus is the bread of life. Where he says, I am the bread of life. Uh, chapter 6, verse 35. Since Jesus, was, was told, since Jesus has told the Jews that he is the prophet Moses spoke of, they want him to prove it by producing the manna. Now, one of the messages that we had a couple of weeks ago, we also talked about how Jesus took them back to the Old Testament, all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy, so that they could see that He was the one that Moses spoke of that said, From your brothers one will rise up who comes after me. And Jesus has said, I am that prophet. So the logical response by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Jewish people who've got this all figured out, they're saying, Okay, if you are this this prophet that Moses spoke of, that means you'll be able to do the things that Moses did. And Moses spoke to God and the manna fell down from the sky. So the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jewish leaders are sitting there saying, well, if you'll just produce us some manna from heaven, then that'll prove that you are the prophet and we'll be satisfied. By the way, if Jesus had done that, they still wouldn't have been satisfied. Y'all ever known somebody who's never satisfied with something no matter what? They wouldn't believe nothing no matter what you told them. And even the, they didn't believe the truth even when the truth was the truth and they knew the truth was the truth, but they still wouldn't believe it. Okay, All right. this, is, this is what we're talking about to Jesus. But Jesus knows that. Jesus straightens them back out. He, so, he goes back to the Scripture and he says, Hey guys, if you'll go back and read your Scriptures again, you'll find out that Moses didn't produce the manna, but that God sent the bread. And by the way, since you now know that God sent the bread, you need to know again that God sent the bread again, and I am the bread of life. And it just ticks the Jews off that much more. You see, Moses didn't give you the manna, Jesus says to them, but God is the one who gave to him. And he says, I am the bread that has come to you. Truly, truly, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gave you the true bread from heaven. He's speaking of himself. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life into the world. Just like we're sustained by the word, that we, by, the bread, by the bread, the food, and the things that we eat, Jesus is the one who sustains us here on life because he is actually the one who provides us with the food that we eat. And Jesus, now listen, listen. How many of y'all have heard this statement before in your lifetime? It says, seeing is believing. 
Have y'all heard that? Just let me check and see. How many of you have actually heard that seeing is believing? I don't think it's the truth. It's definitely not the truth when it comes to Jesus Christ. Because people can see that Jesus Christ truly is walking among them and they know these things that He's teaching and they're seeing the signs, which the, the signs, which are the miracles that are proving that Jesus really is who He says that He is. All right? He's doing these miracles to express that He is the Son of God and if they can truly see that, then they, they'll see Jesus they can believe that He's their Son, that He's the Son of God, but they still don't have eternal life because they won't yield their lives to Him. And Jesus, uh, or Paul comes back later on and He tells us to be saved. It's not just believing that Jesus is the Savior. In fact, the Scripture says, when you believe that Jesus Christ is... Anybody remember what the next word in Romans says? Lord. So when you say Lord, you believe that He is the Master and the one who tells you what to do. So there is some surrender that goes on here. All right, Jesus is, for Jesus, seeing Jesus is not believing. Listen to this. Receiving Jesus is believing in the form of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, how many of you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? You've given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. Follow Him. Okay. So is Jesus speaking literally that on the day that you got saved, you would never physically get hungry again? Now, you know that to be a fact, right? Because some of y'all's stomachs are probably growling right now while I'm preaching. All right? Chances are it's going to happen. So what he's talking about, he's talking about spiritually. He's talking about who we are on the inside. And whoever believes in him shall never thirst. But I say to you that, I have, that, that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. So that means you can go and join all the churches you want to. You can go and be baptized all the times you want to. But if you don't see Jesus as the Lord, as the bread that came from from heaven that gives us eternal life, that you must yield your life to Him, that's evidence that the work of God is not in you. Right? If the work of God is in you, you will follow Him. So as you follow Him, if the work of God is in you... It's because God is working in you because salvation is the work of God which is believing in Him, which is believing unto a changed life. Now you can rebel. I understand that you can rebel. But God will always draw you back. He'll give you a season to let you go. And if you don't come back, He'll kill you and take you to be at home with Him. But, but He's calling you to come for Him. Jesus is not the manna. Manna feeds the physical. Jesus is the bread that feeds and sustains and brings life to us. Verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven, not the bread that the fathers ate, not like manna. They ate the manna and they died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now, eating the physical bread of Jesus Christ doesn't cause your body to live forever. This is why he's not talking about the Lord's Supper right here. He's not talking about eating the body of Christ, which is a symbol to us. This is an illustration he's using so that the people who came across the boat with him are hearing all about the feeding and the bread, and they're following, chasing around, so they can get the bread that they want to have. He's saying this is a spiritual thing. This is an eternal life thing. This is for what's out there. So let's look at the second, let's look at the second thing that he said that, that I want to point out. I came down. From heaven. He says, I came down from heaven. If you look at verse 33, verse 38, verse 41, verse 42, verse 51, verse 58. Now, remember, the book of John is full of sevens. Y'all remember me telling you that? Seven I am stating statements of seven names of Jesus Christ. All of these sevens over and over again. The reason that you need to pay attention to what the sevens are is because the sevens are the things that John and the church is trying to make sure that we understand and remember because it's the perfect number that comes from God, the completion of everything, so that we will have this in our minds and our heart. God absolutely wants us to understand that Jesus Christ is not a man who became God, but that He is God who became a man. And there's a huge difference between that. One starts with man, the other starts with God. And we believe that Jesus is God who took on the form of man simply so that we could see Him, feel Him, touch Him, and He could die on the cross and rise from the grave to give us eternal life. 
Jesus told Nicodemus, I love what you get. The, whole, the whole Bible glues together, but especially the book of John. Chapter 3, verse 13, Jesus told Nicodemus, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, which is the Son of God. And he said, Since I came from heaven down here and I go back up to heaven, that's one of the ways you know I am the Son of God. It was Paul who wrote it this way. Listen to this. Paul's quote uh, from one of the early confessions of the church, early on in the church. They were reading these confessions to try to help everybody understand. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 6, 7, 8, and 9 is one of those confessions. In that confession is, is written this. I'm going to read part of it because I know you'll remember it. And in the other part, you may have glossed over in your mind. It says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of man. He was in heaven. He came down here as a man in the likeness of a man so that we would be able to see him, touch him, feel him, know him. Because no man can look at God and walk away from that. So God always sent a manifestation of his presence down here, an incarnation of God so that we could see what that was while he was here on earth. Yes, Jesus Christ was always in heaven. There never was a time when the Father was not. There never was a time when the Son was not. There never was a time when the Spirit was not. God is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all at one time. But at various times, He shows Himself to us and He works Himself differently in our lives at different times. He came down from heaven and all God's people said. Amen. You know, if it had never came, we wouldn't be able to obtain salvation. The third thing that the text talks about, keeps bringing out, is that the Spirit gives life. The Spirit gives life. Spirit is, is God Himself, which He comes inside of us at the instantaneous second of salvation. It doesn't matter where you are in the prayer when you pray it. It doesn't matter. You know, I believe that most of the people that pray the sinner's prayer who are actually saved pray the sinner's prayer because the Holy Spirit comes in and causes them to pray the sinner's prayer. Okay? You, we can debate about that, and I may be wrong on that, but I don't think I am. But the Holy Spirit is what gave you the sense enough to know that you sinned and fall short of God's glory. And then you gave your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. Then God began to illuminate you and show you and confirm to you that Jesus Christ is in you. So we can't force people to pray prayers and make them saved because no man can come to the Father unless the Father, no one can come to the Son unless the Father does what? Draws him. How many times did he say that in the text? Two times. He says it two times, so we'll make sure that we get this. This is connected to one of the resurrections that Jesus spoke of. Now remember I told you the three resurrections. The last two resurrections were physical resurrections where the body rose up. The, the, the second resurrection where Jesus was a physical, where Jesus was laid down in a tomb and he rose from the grave. But the other one was about that spiritual resurrection. If we, we, if we will go back to John chapter 5, verses 24 and 5, it says, Jesus starts off again with that truly, truly I say to you. By the way, when he says truly, truly I say to you, kids, that's the same thing as your mom and daddy grabbing you by the ears, pulling you up in their face, and, they say, and them saying, Listen to this. Did anybody else's parents do that to them? Or was my mom and dad the only one that did that? Of course, I was wild. But anyway, they put, you know. And this is what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. Because we're going to bypass the judgment. But he has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and has now come. And has now come. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, they're hearing Jesus who is the Son of God speaking and those who hear will live because we now hear the bread of life speaking to us who is the Son of God. It awakens us and we become saved because the Holy Spirit is in us and we can hear now because we have been drawn to the Father. And when you're drawn to the Father, you can't help but come to the Father because He's the one who's doing the drawing. Paul describes this same resurrection in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. He says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. If that spirit is in you, he goes on and he says, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Right? How many of y'all in here today have a mortal body? Right? When do you get the eternal life? 
when you finish at the end? No! Now! By the way, that's why Jesus said, I came to give you life and give it to you. Can anybody help me? More abundantly. Is life hard? Yes. But God is there to see us through. The fourth thing that the text keeps talking about over and over again is this this part where it says, that I should lose nothing of all that has been given me. That I should lose nothing at all that has been given to me. And this is where Baptists get crucified by the public, uh, other, the other denominations. Say, you know, you, you believe, you, you, all you Baptists, you think you can't lose your salvation. You think you can't lose your salvation. You see, old Joe, he came down here to church and he did, and he did good for two years and he backslid and he never came back to church. He's always out here. Well, in order for him to have backslidden and not be saved, one of two things either happened. He wasn't saved to start with, or the other is God is wrong. Thank you, Miss Judy. In case y'all didn't hear that, Miss Judy said God is not wrong. Because Jesus said, I'm not going to lose anything that the Father gives me. In our human thought, we figure we can lose anything. In our humanity, we think we're so strong, we don't have to do what God tells us that we have to do. <laughs> Tell that to Jonah. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that He has given me, but rise it up on the last day. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will rise Him up on the last day. You know, I praise God that I don't have to worry about me losing my salvation every time I sin. Y'all know how many times I'd have lost my salvation by now? At least twice. <laughs> Boy, that was an arrogant thought, wasn't it? Since I started preaching today. <laughs> Maybe if I say it that way. But it's not... The work of salvation is not because we prayed the prayer. The work of salvation is not because we believed. The work of salvation is that God caused us to believe. And the reason He caused us to believe and the reason He has drawn us to Himself is because the Holy Spirit is in us. And I don't know about you, but when the Holy Spirit got in me, I argued with God about that for about six weeks or so. But He wouldn't take no for an answer. And I broke. And I am so glad that I broke. Because everyone who falls on the stone is broken. And that is what salvation is. He calls us to salvation. Listen, here's a couple of quick truths that are contained in this passage. I've got to get them to you. Salvation is granted by the Father's discretion. Salvation is, gran- is, is granted by the Father's discretion. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. That's verse 65 down there. If you look, verse 65 says, no one can come unless it is granted him by the Father. So it's always God's work. It's always his his idea. It's he that initiates the process inside of us. The second thing he says, salvation is the work of God, not of man. The work that he spoke of was our work of believing. Our believing is there because the Holy Spirit is in us and it causes us to believe because it's God's work that is doing that. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe. This is the work of God that you believe in him who has sent him. Verse 29. And then God draws people to Jesus for salvation which is John 6, 44 where he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to him. Okay. These are, these are the facts contained in the scriptures. But I must proceed. I know my time is out. Has the Spirit... I ask, I'm going to close with this question. Has the Spirit given you life? How do I know if the Spirit gave me life or not? I want to go back all the way to the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, Jeremiah speaks a word 
God has given Jeremiah a word to speak. And this is the word that Jeremiah says to him. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, which is what the whole New, old, new, the whole new Testament is all about, the new covenants, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, by the way, though I was their husband, declared the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord for, all, for they all know me from the, la from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. You believe because the Spirit is in you to cause you to believe since you become who you're supposed to become in Christ Jesus. Those who seek Jesus out of selfish desires. Now remember that's what the passage was talking about. The people were coming to Jesus not because they believed He was the Son of God but because He could produce bread. Those who seek Jesus out of selfish desire, like the people who were following Jesus for the bread, will fall away because the Spirit has not given them life. Okay, A lot of people come to the church because they're embarrassed. A lot of people come to the church because they want God to do something for them. They want something out of God. If I just go to God and I do certain kind of work, surely He'll do this thing which I'm asking Him to do. Nothing could be further from the truth on what salvation is. God doesn't do miracles so that we can have miracles performed in our lives. God does miracles to confirm that He is the God He says He is and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that He sent. And after this, many of the disciples turned back and they no longer walked Lord God in heaven, 